Good call, right? <laughs> Knowledge to, to know what to do. Wisdom is when and where to do it. Okay. Uh, t- today, again, we are focusing on, on how God, d- what God did. We won't know why, except for his glory and timing. But what God did, what God's doing, and how we are called to adjust, to repent, and align ourselves with the season at hand. That's what Martin Luther did, John Calvin, and the rest. I believe as your pastor, we are entering a new season in the life of Christ's church. We see them every 500 years. I'm not sure if you know this, but this Halloween, October 31st, 2017, is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis on the church Wittenberg door. 500 years. Every 500 years we've seen not a little shift, not a massive shift bigger than the great awakenings our country has seen. Those were of the same ilk as this. They were echoes of what Luther went through. We are entering a new season. On your feet, get it, not literally, but get excited, be alert, get get pumped. This is a season of light and love, but I'll warn you that it's a season of gospel, not institution. And for those of us invested deeply in an institution like myself, we are the rich men. It's easier for an eye to go through a, a, a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. People who are institution bound, wrapped up, uh, invested in a current situation, the rich are the ones who struggle the most. When there's revolution, the people pre invested are the ones that hurt the most. They're the ones most opposed to it. Those who are poor, those who are sad, those who are going through a difficult week. Those, those are the ones who want the light more than anybody else. They have no light in their life. They want the light of Christ, as opposed to the people that have the false idols. So this is, this is where we are, and in, in, uh, we're just going to hit it. We're going to do Scripture in just a second, actually, because there's a few things I want to say. Okay, when it comes to the Protestant Reformation, the word Protestant comes from the word protest. And to this day, we still protest. Now, when you protest, that means you're not leaving. If you leave, you leave. Protesting is for staying and seeking a few things to adjust and change. Martin Luther was seeking the Roman Catholic Church to make a few adjustments. So before I say anything in this series, I want to put this up front. We, this series, and myself, we are not opposed or against Catholics. Most of us have lots of friends there. Many of us are raised Catholic. Most, I mean, you name it. It's complicated, but we all have a relationship to the Roman Catholic Church in some way. I am not against the Roman Catholic Church. This series isn't against, against the Roman Catholic Church. Luther wasn't against the Roman Catholic Church. He wasn't against individuals. He was against doctrine. Damning doctrine that was teaching people things that wasn't producing eternal life and was causing people to spend their life stressed out, broken, and distanced from God. So up front, if you've got a hymnal in front of you, turn to page 359. I'll just give you an example. Some of you were raised in the Methodist Church or Episcopal Church, uh, Catholic Church. Uh, I I wasn't raised in any of those. But in our hymnal, we have something called affirmations of faith. They're creeds, come on. Uh, Disciples just don't like that word for some reason. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is the bedrock doctrinal system of truth that Christians have believed for thousands of years across the world. We share in common more than we have different with other Christians, okay? We have way more in common. Today we're going to be talking about two things that we don't have in common with the Roman Catholic Church. Two. The problem is they're pretty important things. But real quick, we share, for instance, that now you may disagree, and we, we're a non-credal church, and, and I'm, I'm obligated to preach the faith, and so I may not stand up here every week and preach the Apostles' Creed, but to preach against the Apostles' Creed is foolish. It does not benefit a person to preach against the virgin birth, the resurrection of the Lord. When people do that, they're bored. 
They may not even be a believer. And they've got too much time on their hands to say, well, there's no such thing as a resurrection. There's no such thing as forgiveness. What are you doing? Go home, you're drunk. You know, just like, don't, me don't mess with the faith that was infused to the original apostles in the first generation that became the bedrock of the church. So the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Most people believe that in the church. The few that don't, I'm not sure what's going on, but that's what the Catholic Church teaches. That's what the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches. That's what the Baptists believe. That's what the Episcopalians believe. That's what the Methodists say every time. If those of you who are raised Methodists, you stand up and say that creed, right? Amen. I love that creed. It's the basis of the faith. Now, those, that creed is huge when you study it. Those are just that's the, the Cliff's Notes version, the Bullet Points version. Now, I've got to say that up front because what I'm about to say is, is straightforward. It does differentiate us from the Roman Catholic Church, but it's not intended to be an anti-Catholic thing, okay? And in fact, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, some of the doctrine that Luther was fighting against in the Catholic Church, you and I subconsciously believe it in our flesh, in our sin, namely, we struggle to believe that we actually are okay before God through faith alone. If you haven't struggled with that, I don't know if you've sat with it. It's a struggle to believe that Jesus Christ has satisfied God on our behalf, and if we have faith in Jesus, God's delight is ours before we lift a finger. That may be fine and all on Sunday morning or when you're reading Chicken Soup for the Soul or something, that's great, or Jesus Calling. But when you're home or you get, you're get having a bad week or it's a dark week or it's difficult, it's hard to believe that you're okay. And so the things that have been preached in the Roman Catholic Church, the system built, was not something, it's not something I agree with, but it's definitely not something I'm free from. In a sense, we're all little Catholics in need of the gospel. So this isn't an us and them sermon. This is what happened to Martin Luther as a Roman Catholic priest. Now, a couple of things happened uh, that caused him to come to contact with, with five basic truths that we're going to talk about over the next coming, coming weeks, five basic truths called the solas, uh, where authority is held, what saves you, um, who has satisfied God, you or Jesus, um, why are we here? Once you're of faith, why don't we just get raptured up to heaven? Why does he leave us on earth? Um, how is it that a person is saved? Is it through free will or is it through God's grace? How does this work? And Martin Luther was elected by God so that the gospel would burst out into the scene in a way it hadn't been burst onto in 500 years. There was a city uh, in Geneva <laughs> the city of Geneva that lived a really hard life and they put into words the motto of the time was life is hard and then you die. And salvation was an elusive thing that only the rich or the goody goodies got. So that wasn't even a concept for the poor. Life is hard and then you die. But something happened to that city that culturally shifted the heart of that town and of that region, so they changed their topic, their motto, their understanding. It's in Latin, post tenebris lux, after darkness light, that light is coming, that even though it hurts, even though it's dark outside, even though it's painful outside, 
we are not children of darkness. We're children of light. And the light which is coming is not something we muster up in ourselves. It's a promise of God. He will return in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's it. The gospel is the way that we connect to an eternal truth. It's the key that unlocks the door. Without the gospel, you will start preaching a gospel of darkness, a crushing gospel of works, a deadly gospel of self-righteousness. And so this happened to Luther. It was highly inconvenient. He was quite invested in the Roman Catholic Church, recently out of seminary, one of the best monks of the Augustinian order. He even said later in life, if any monk could have achieved salvation through monkery, I'm that monk. I never missed church. I confessed all my sins, and if I thought I missed one, I got up late at night and confessed that one twice the more. I, I worked my tail off. I was white-knuckling my way to stay in line with God's will. That's what he thought it was all about. I'm going to pause real quick. It's really cold in here now, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. If you want to know what a true elder looks like, Ronnie, Ronnie's a servant, servant elder. Amen. Uh, not that the other elders aren't bad. I mean, those all the elders. Aren't. <laughs> gotta be careful. Gotta be careful. Gotta get letters. You know. Okay. Now, so today we're going to talk about two of the five. We'll get through them all throughout the series. But the two greatest things that cause Luther the biggest problems, and yet us the greatest benefit, and God the biggest glory, had to do with Scripture. And had to do with faith. Sola scriptura, sola fide are the two words. You're going to hear the word sola throughout this series. In Latin, it means only. And Luther fell in love with the Bible. And he said, this is what we need. And the Catholic Church back in that day, and even the, today, would say, oh no, we believe in the Bible. And Luther said, you left a word out. Sola. Sola only. Sola was the greatest word of the Reformation. Because some people say, I believe in faith. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God's glory. And Luther would say, only. Only. Sola Scriptura means that Luther discovered by the power of the Holy Spirit, against his teaching training and his own will, that if you let the Bible speak for itself, by itself, you're going to get a different message than if you listen to the Pope, to your feelings, to the culture, or to your training. That's what he heard. And he heard that so deeply that he began to test it. He began to walk through the scriptures, learn from God, and lo and behold, he heard a different message than he'd heard his whole life. Whatever our authority for truth is will determine the way we see the world. For instance, if I ask three different people what's wrong with our country, three different people what's wrong with our country, I'm going to get three different answers. A liberal person will say, well, there's not enough justice and you know, there's, there's, we need more justice and the, the president's a bad man. If you ask a conservative what's wrong with America, he'll say liberals. If you ask a religious person what's wrong with America, a guy like me will say, well, we don't know the Lord. Depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer, right? That's authority. Whatever th authority you listen to, you're going to get a different answer. What Luther discovered, he discovered that if you let the scriptures be the place where you meet the Father, if this is how you in enter into the throne room of God, the great council, the full council of God, and you silence the Pope, traditions, your experience, if you let the Bible speak for itself, you'll have a different experience altogether. You'll have a, you'll have a different encounter. You'll learn things you didn't think. You, you'll, you'll, the Bible starts asking you questions. You don't ask the Bible questions. And so Luther had a love affair with the Bible. He just couldn't stop reading it. And, and the problem is it got him into trouble because he heard things that were different than he heard preaching from his professors and from the Pope. It was a wild time for him. And I'll tell you up front real quick, I know 
the concept of biblical infallibility is a struggle for many people. I know it. I'm an intellectual. I get it. I understand there's two stories about how, how a, uh, in the book of Genesis, two creation accounts. One creation account, Adam and Eve are created last. The second creation account, we're created uh, before all the animals. I, I, I know that there's four different stories of what happens on Easter morning. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not new. I mean, people say, you know, how can you believe it? They throw all these, I was like, hey, you think I haven't read the Bible? I know they're in there. I, I, I understand what it is to struggle. I had a conversation with somebody recently about biblical infallibility, that this is a trustworthy source, that God has authorized this and this alone to seek his will. You might have dreams, you might have visions, you might have something else, but if it's not biblical, it's off. You're not going to believe it. Sola Scriptura means infallibly that this is the authorized revelation of God's character, his will, his purposes. This is where he meets his children by the power of the Holy Spirit most consistently. And nothing will go against Scripture if it's from God. And so I was having a conversation about this, and they, this person was struggling with infallibility. I said, no, I get you, I get you. But who's more fallible, you or the Bible? Who has more mistakes? We do. If you want to do the comparison thing, who has more mistakes? The culture, which changes a mile a minute, or this Bible? Or um, your feelings, or your memory? Which is more fallible? Are you, here, are you really telling me that you're perfect in the Bible? Because most accusations come from a position of arrogant judgmentalism based on, well, I've been, I have a degree in underwater basket weaving, and Second Hesitations 4 says da-da-da-da-da. It's like, well, gee, I never thought of it that way. I guess, I guess let's stop reading the Bible. You must, here's the new Bible, Karen. Karen's the new Bible. Speak, Karen. <laughs> All hail Karen, you speak. It, if, if you do not believe in the authority of the scriptures to reveal truth, you will be a slave to whatever sounds right. You will be a slave to a, a wet finger in the air. Luther learned that. He was struck. He started meeting God. He stopped arguing. He stopped questioning the, the who care questions and started saying, God, who are you? He started hearing a different answer. Number one is Luther started to meet the Lord on the basis of the scripture alone. It was a lonely place to be because the rest of the world, including the institutional church he was a part of, was saying, the Bible is not the only source of authority. And Luther said, you're wrong. He went to bed. Confessed confess this late in life. He went to bed almost every night thinking, am I the wrong one? And if you've never been a pioneer, a leader to go step out, do something bold with the Lord and not have faced that doubt question, I face it all, am I the wrong one here? What if I'm wrong? Luther struggled with that all the time. It was Luther against the world. A man of the book. In two weeks, we'll, next week we're talking about his life. Next week we're talking about John Calvin. Another man of the book. So Luther read the Bible. And let me show you one thing he read. His favorite book was Galatians. His second favorite, Romans. But he read this also in Ephesians. He wrote sermons on this text. Ephesians 2, 8. And real quick, he was in a system that was teaching that your salvation comes through your ability to keep yourself clean. That God had revealed through his holy church all the hoops to jump through. It's just like school. Perfect attendance. You want green points, not red points. Sound familiar? Class dojo, anyone? Right? Yeah? It, it, you, you jump through all the stuff, and then you get an A. If you don't get an A, you go to purgatory until you get an A. They give you a little office in the corner so you can keep working. Yeah. 
Verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. The word of the Lord. Ephesians, Romans, the book of John, the Old Testament, Abraham, Abel. Remember Abel, Cain? They're the first. Post fall, the first story of two biological brothers, one with faith, one without. That's the difference. Abel was the first martyr. He was killed by his brother because he had the righteousness that comes by faith. What Luther discovered through reading the scriptures, by challenging, and, and real quick, back to this authority, what biblical authority means, be skeptical of yourself, be skeptical of the church, be skeptical of science. Now, I'm a science guy. I accept science, but ask the same questions that you're asking scripture. Be skeptical of how you feel, be skeptical, but don't be skeptical on the basis of what God has said. So he learned that practice, which was a new thing for him to go through. And he started to stand on the promises without monkeying with them. And one of the first promises he heard was that every single thing that he was required to do, calculus, physics, every class he was required to take, Every law he was required to keep has been accomplished through God's Son. Jesus Christ is the valedictorian. And Luther got pulled up on the podium with him. That's what he heard. The sufficiency of Christ and the only way for a person to receive the righteousness of God, the okayness with God, is by faith in what Jesus has already done. The one thing you want to be okay, the one thing you want when you're born to be held, to be provided for, to be okay, to be approved of, for somebody to say, you're mine and I'm yours, and no matter what, nothing can change that. The one thing you want, Jesus has accomplished for you. And what you want is to hear God speak from heaven over you, you're mine, and I'm pleased with you. Jesus heard that. In baptism, transfiguration, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He heard what you want. And the gospel says, according to scripture, if you have faith that Jesus has satisfied God, it has nothing to do with you. If you have faith that Jesus aced the test, if you have faith that Jesus got an A in physics and all the, lot, the rest, if you have faith that Jesus had a 4.0, if you have faith that Jesus was the perfect mom, if you have faith that Jesus was the perfect dad, if you have faith that Jesus was the perfect person before the Lord, if you have faith that Jesus did it, then for some miraculous reason, when God looks at you, he, when God looks at Jesus, he pardons you. It's a mystery. I don't begin to understand it. I just drive it. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, God, God looks at you as if you've never sinned. It's a big if. The first service I was mentioning, take Texas Tech across the street, 35,000 students, all trying to justify their existence. What major are you in? Yeah, I know the deal. I'm in a harder major than you are. Right? 
I did that stuff. I mean, come on. Comparing. You want your friend to do well, but you want to do a little bit better than them. Right? Justify my existence. What am I going to do? What's your plan? What, what do you... And you, you, you spend your energy trying to justify yourself. So I want you to go imagine we're flying like a drone over Texas Tech. You've got 35,000 students walking around campus. Some of them are doing really well comparatively. Some are in fraternities, sororities. Some are in church on Sunday morning. Some are, you know, all over the stuff. You know, just you've got all sorts of situations, and you've got some people that are just completely despondent and broken. You've got some people that are thinking about dropping out. You've got some people that are just... The only reason they don't go home because home is worse than here. You got me? Diverse. But when God surveys Texas Tech, he sees his own son's glory and perfection on top of countless people, those who have faith in him. He sees upon you Complete divine approval. He sees his glory. He sees his love, his beauty, his acceptance. You have everything. The only reason you're still here is to glorify him. You have nothing to gain, nothing to take. By faith alone, God looks at you and sees heaven. He sees glory. That's what Luther heard a little different than the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church says, you'll get there someday. If, 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 I just ifed all over myself, you know? If you do this, you do that. No ifs. And one point Luther made that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to task you with as we prepare to, to break. It's a litmus test. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. That's how you receive Jesus. Jesus does it all. Your clutch grabs his engine as soon as you have faith in him. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Here's the thing. If you participated in your own salvation, then you could boast. I'll show you what a boast looks like. Why can't they just have faith? I got my life in order. Why can't why can't why can't Troyce get her life in order? It's a boast. Look how close I am. glorifying Christ, but I end up boasting in myself. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a throttling gospel that says you have nothing to boast about. Where you are, you added nothing to, because Jesus Christ is sufficient. If you added to his 4.0 one thing you did, you would drop his GPA. Quit it. You're the problem. You're not the solution. Quit adding. If he's your defense attorney, you go to court. God's the judge. The devil is the prosecuting attorney. Jesus is your defense attorney. Just be quiet. Let him do his job. Don't say peep. Even your best performance is going to... <laughs> it's trash. Do you see? That's... The paradox. That's the joy. That's the, that's the power to say, how is a person saved? Jesus. How is Jesus part of my life? Faith. Not in me, but that he has pleased God. Vicariously through someone else. It's so simple, and we've complicated it so much that today, as we close down, we will stand to sing, and that's how we all respond. I am available in the back of the sanctuary, and if, if you're getting stirred right now, and this is your moment, come see me. I would love to pray with you. Come meet with you. That our salvation, according to Scripture, consistently, every regulation in the Old Testament 
What does the Lord require of you? Everything, your answer is, Jesus did it. Quit taking the Bible and saying, this is what I have to do. No, no, Jesus did it. Now, if I'm called to do it, I love to do it, but I'm not doing it to earn anything. He got a 4.0. I'm awful at life. He's great at life. He's the Lord of life. I'm the... I'm on the B team. That's what this is about. Esteeming, glorifying, celebrating what Jesus Christ has done. Claiming that promise, standing on it, and trusting that what he's accomplished has power in your life too. That God is delighting over me even in the darkness, James. He's delighting over me because I'm his. He made it so. And what God has decided to do God's going to finish. He's more invested in us than we are. He bought you like a piece of land, and he put a crop in you. All you have to do is let it happen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Christ, Jesus, all-sufficient, all-glorious, all hail his name. In the end, the world will see the light. We have the benefit of the gospel today to walk in it, feeble and broken, having no confidence in our own righteousness our own our own performance our own ability to even understand but one thing we do understand that you are pleased with jesus and that if you're pleased with jesus and we see that acknowledge that you're pleased with us somehow we receive that father we walk in that we run with that we love this world like you do it nothing to take only to give bless and keep us now father may you open hearts and may you unleash the gift of faith within the church of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.